My, my first intimate contact, not intimate, but a professional contact with him was in connection with the argument before the Supreme Court on the constitutional validity of the Public Utility Holding Company Act of 1935. Mm -hmm. That's a long time ago. Now, what was your role there at that time? Well, I was a uh, working, I was on the staff of the Securities and Exchange Commission, but assigned and as, as an assistant to Benjamin Victor Cohen, Ben Cohen, and Thomas Corcoran, Tom Corcoran, who at that time were personal assistants to FDR, President Roosevelt. And uh, they were as close to him as I think uh, personal assistants can be. Sure. And did all of the kind of difficult work that a president has got to get done but doesn't want to do it himself. And so I saw a good deal of how they operated in the Roosevelt administration. Mm -hmm. They were wonderful people too. I was particularly close to Ben Cohen and uh, worked with him. A what was he? I think it was a dentist in Baltimore had been picked by John W. Davis <coughs> of the Davis Paul Wardwell firm in New York and a former candidate for the president himself, he had a hundred shares of stock of a public utility holding, holding company stock. Mm -hmm. Not much, and how he was picked, in a sense the intelligence and cunning of a New York, uh, an experienced New York lawyer, uh, in raising the constitutional validity of that act which had just been passed. The act was a powerful one in the sense that uh, electric power in this country had been first taken, the operating companies had been taken over by some, a lot of them, by holding companies. Mm -hmm. And then some of these holding companies were taken care of, were owned by higher holding companies. And then there were third tier holding companies which held all of the others. So it ended up that a relatively few uh, uh, companies in the country were owning vast quantities of the power that they country needed. It was a little bit scary to be in such limited hands. The Congress dealt with it by first requiring these companies, the top holding companies, to register, to simply sign their names on a piece of paper. They didn't want to sign because that would be assumed to be accepting the limitations sure. of the law. So the utility companies, the top holding companies certainly, have recruited one of the best lawyers in the country who picked a dentist in Baltimore to be the person who objects to the uh, filing the registration of the pub of the third tier public utility holding companies. Well, 
and he brought the suit and uh, neither Tom Corcoran nor Ben Cohen had done very much in terms of uh, litigating. Uh, their actions were mostly political mm -hmm. and activities political. So what happened was that uh, they had to go out to get a lawyer to, rep to represent the government in connection with the suit in Baltimore. The one they picked was a young one from a distinguished law firm here in Washington, and uh, his name was Dean Atchison. He's a young fellow who later became Secretary of State and did so much through the resurrection of Europe after World War II. Well, uh, that lawsuit, uh, in a sense, tested the Can, can the federal government simply eliminate these third-tier companies? And that's what ultimately could be done under the law. Now I'll skip a lot of intervening litigation in almost in a number of uh, courts in this country and take you to the Supreme Court. At that time, Justice Jackson uh, was, I think, Attorney General. Mm -hmm. or I don't recall whether he was Assistant Attorney or Attorney General. No, I think Solicitor General. Mm -hmm. He was dealing with the Supreme Court. And the two people who were going to argue the case before the Supreme Court were Justice, were Solicitor General Jackson and Ben Cohen. I was with Ben. We had taken everything that the court could conceivably ask to see or ask to be shown uh, to the court, packed it all, carried it all up there, came very early and so that we would be on time. And we came into the courtroom, sat down at the council's bench, and uh, there were two seats. One, uh, Justice Jackson, or Solicitor General Jackson, was going to open the, this, the argument, and Ben Cohen was to follow with, in a sense, the legal aspects. One would deal with the story of the law and the facts of the case, and the other would deal with the law of the case. But uh, the courtroom was filled. The two of us were there. Just, but Jackson had not yet arrived. Uh, I remember speaking with Ben should I go out and telephone? Should I do something? But uh, he said, wait. He was more nervous than I was because what was going to happen? Would he go and apologize for the Citizen General? <laughs> but the court had not yet come in. And there's a curtain. And the curtain has to be parted and the ju justices walk in and occupy the nine seats. So we sat there, we watched, there's a big clock. We were watching every second as, as it went by, and he was still not there. The clerk I saw was getting ready to stand up and uh, followed the old English custom of calling everybody in to hear the court and to sit down. And uh, he got up, 
started to speak, and then at the very last second before the curtains parted, in walked uh, Justice Jackson, cheerful, as if nothing had happened, and to him <laughs> nothing had happened. We were quite literally perspiring as to what to, what's to be done. He patted us on the back, sat down, opened his notes, and uh, waited until the members of the court were seated. He got there, I suppose, 10 seconds, 15 seconds before the court, and uh, was with total aplomb. He was just totally unmoved by the fact that uh, he had come at the exact time that necessary, but belatedly. Uh, he was a uh, I did not have the feeling in later contact with him, not too many. I was not close to the justice when he was on the court. Uh, but I did see him from time to time. I had myself been a law clerk for uh, Justice Douglas. And Frankfurter was on the court, whom I had known at the law school, Harvard Law School, and uh, was comfortable with him and uh, really revered the court. Now, uh, I like... Uh, to think about the times when we were working on the briefs, but the person with whom I work most closely on the in the Solicitor General's office was a person was the deputy for the Solicitor General, and It happened so that we lived together. And there's a group of six of us had a house in Washington, six young men uh, uh, together, all working in the government, dealing with these problems that we're talking about. And uh, I, I saw a lot of the justice action through his eyes. It was Paul Freund. He was the professor of constitutional law at Harvard Law School for many years. We were very close friends. He, he was somewhat a few years older than I was. But uh, that was, in a sense, the view of uh, him that I had uh, most intimately in the early days. I came here myself in 1930-35. How did you get to Washington? Well, uh, I had been at the Harvard Law School. Uh, Where's hometown for you? Where, where are you from? I'm from West Virginia, mm -hmm. Huntington, West Virginia. In the, my senior year at law school, I remember going to the city that I had the most regard for from West Virginia was Cincinnati, Ohio, just a hundred miles or so up the river. A big city by our standards and one that I enjoyed visiting. In my senior year, Christmas time, I went to Cincinnati, was interviewed by uh, law firms, and was actually hired by one. I came back, talked to Justice Frankfurter, and told him, knew the firm, Dinsmore, Scholl, Sawyer, and Dinsmore, mm -hmm. and uh, I think uh, Sawyer was subsequently Secretary of Commerce in Washington. 
and the thought it was a first-rate firm, should stick with it. But he said, why don't you take a year off and come to Washington? They will like it because it will give them an in introduction to Washington on the ground. And uh, you will enjoy it, I'm sure. So I said, why not? And I called and talked to Dinsmore and uh, uh, Judge Dinsmore. And uh, he said, fine, no reason why not. And uh, that was that. Two months later, after my initial experiences in Washington, I had the feeling that it's unlikely that I would want to go away at the end of one year. So I called and was relieved of the obligation. The, but uh, that first year, I remember the summer of 35, that's before I came down, uh, I had a friend, David Hexter, he was later uh, the lawyer for the Federal Reserve Board. And uh, he had been invited to a uh, celebration of an engagement of a friend of his in Washington. I had never been to Washington. And he asked me to come with him. So I came, and the man who uh, was being engaged was Abe Fortas, mm -hmm. who was later a distinguished lawyer in Washington and, of course, a member of the Supreme Court. Uh, and so I met various people during that summer. In the fall, after I had taken the bar examination in, in West Virginia and uh, finished the preliminary necessities before coming here, and I came to Washington and joined this group of people of whom I've spoken, uh, the lawyers, half a dozen of us, and later on we met, lived together, two or three of them were law clerks for members of the Supreme Court. So you came to know Washington fairly early and well. And these were affiliated pretty much with the Democratic Party and with uh, uh, the Roosevelt? Remember now, this was 35. Mm -hmm. The stock market break had come in 29. Mm -hmm. There was misery in the country in those intervening years. And 35 was no different. There was hunger, there was starvation, there was suicide, uh, there was fear. Mm -hmm. uh, Roosevelt was doing a marvelous job, but he was uh, the, the central figure of the times. Uh, there were others who, and, uh, who were with him, but he was the key person. And so, it was not a time of uh, pleasure. It was a time, a disastrous period in our own history. The Democrats were in office, and so the people I knew in Washington were Democrats uh, for the most part. I mean, you're, you just dropped some names that we just read about, and yet Tommy Corcoran. Talk to me about Tommy Corcoran. What kind of guy was he? There were two phases of Tom. When he was working for the president, he was a dedicated, committed, careful, superb lawyer and a perfectionist in writing. He was a marvelous speechwriter, 
and a most amiable, pleasant, easy to be with, humorous, uh, had a fund of jokes, a man easy to be with and just, as I say, a pleasure to be with. And he had a lot of difficult problems to discharge for the president. Not too tall, a little bit overweight, good-looking Irishman, uh, and anyone who knew Tom liked him. You just enjoyed being with him. He was committed, totally committed, to Ben Cohen. How they, it's a separate story, a book or two had been written about it, about how they met and came together. But they were together when I knew them. And uh, Ben was somewhat older, seven or eight years. Uh, ben had practiced in New York serious student, uh, careful writer, uh, careful spokesman. He didn't say more than what he knew mm -hmm. with many qualifications. Uh, Tom was different, spontaneous. He was just a joy to be with and uh, a man who played the, what do you call uh, The accordion? The, uh, the accordion, and sang, and played the piano. FDR loved that, and of course, all of his friends did. I remember one time he came to my house, uh, when I was living in Alexandria, where I still am, the same house. Uh, and he brought his accordion with him, put it down by the piano, and uh, later sang. It was, uh, he was just a, a wonderful man as a human being to be with. When he became, a, when he left the government and became a lawyer, he had a large family to take care of, mm -hmm. heavy expenses, about eight or nine, I don't, I don't remember the numbers of children, but it's certainly more than five and probably around eight, maybe more. Uh, he felt he had to earn money, and he did. Uh, recent books about him have criticized him, and I'm sure that uh, in some cases at least there was some justification for the criticism. But I think of him as a human being because I knew him at the time when he was in government, working with the rest of us, doing just what we were doing, only better. Uh, he was a, uh, I find, I think of him as a good man who made some mistakes when he was practicing law. I call them mistakes, other people will object to that, but I don't. You were the first law clerk of Justice William O. Douglas. I am and I liked him. How'd that happen? How did you connect? Well. Uh, in, I came in 35, tied to the SEC. When Tom and Ben, in the rare times when they weren't busy, uh, didn't need me, then I would go back to the SEC. And I wrote opinions and I did a lot of work at the SEC and enjoyed it. At one point, I was uh, a new member of the commission came, a man by the name of Leon Henderson. Mm -hmm. That's a picture of Ben Corn up there. And uh, 
Leon was an economist and had been with the Democratic National Committee and uh, he was appointed to the commission by the president and I was asked at the time to help him as an assistant. So I became an assistant to Henderson on the a member of the commission of the SEC. So uh, later, Douglas, who had been a member of the commission as Henderson had been, uh, became chairman of the commission. He needed an assistant to work on opinions and so on. And I was asked to join, go with him. I was serving as his assistant when he became, when Justice Brandeis stepped down in early part of late, either late 38 or early 39. I won't go through the story, but Douglas was nominated, uh, asked me to go with him as his law clerk, and the picture that you have uh, was taken, I remember, on April 20th, uh, 39. Uh, and we were close ever since, ever since uh, until his death. Well, I think he was quoted in his uh, autobiography that was published posthumously about he treated you as his, felt like you were his son. So you had a long standing relationship. Yes. And uh, he was regarded as a tough man, not easy to deal with. It was just not my experience. Uh, I could speak with him about anything and did. <laughs> I could make a suggestion, which he would listen to, and we were simply close, and uh, remained so until, I'll never forget, uh, he had already suffered a stroke. Death couldn't have been very far off. He had either difficulty in speaking or totally unable to speak. Uh, he asked me in a little note or through his secretary to join him for lunch at the university club here in Washington. He often came there for lunch when he was on the court or elsewhere. And uh, I did. He could barely walk. He couldn't talk. We sat there at the table, and I held his hand, one hand, and we held each other's hands, and uh, he started crying, I started crying. Just at the table. We didn't say a word that time. Our hands were simply close. Uh, I knew that death was coming. He did too. And we were saying farewell. Yeah. Wow. And uh, that was it. Someone came to help him in to help him out went to his car and went back to the court. He shouldn't have been at the court. He should have been in a hospital. But he was where he wanted to be. Right. Were there close friends on the court itself with Douglas? Did he have, I mean, it was Black a, uh, you know, on and off, it seemingly over time, they had a relationship, they didn't have a relationship. Uh, if you look back and see William Douglas, did he, was, he, was he close to anybody in the court? 
On the court? On the court, yeah. Oh, uh, he certainly was close to Black, Justice Black. Uh, <clears throat> it was when Justice Black died that I bought his house that I'm living in now. Is that right? That was 33 years ago. Uh, I think it was closest to Bla Justice Black. He, of course, knew Felix Frankfurter very well. There was certain tension, possibly even hostility there, but uh, certainly tension. Uh, I don't know of uh, when, of course, he was close to others on the court, but if there was, I don't think he had any intimate friends. He was a man who worked alone, who worked very fast. When he worked, he had the books piled up in front of him, writing an opinion, and that's what he did until he finished what he was working on. Uh, it was, he was driven to do, to work not only in a conscientious way, but in a, when he was committed to one thing, that thing had to be finished before he could take the next. And he worked intensely on it. And so he didn't go around <laughs> the court uh, chatting with people. Uh, at least not so far as I ever saw. Did he ever mention, uh, I know one of the things in, in the Robert Jackson story is the whole issue dealing with the Jewel Ridge case, the Hugo Black recusal, and ultimately that period of time Jackson's at Nuremberg, Chief Justice Stone dies, the letter, did, did Douglas ever talk about that? Not, the, not with me. Yeah. Uh, we used to talk about the politics and what was going on in Washington, and, and not on the court. Yeah. I have no recollection of uh, his ever talking with me about other members of the court. Right other than perhaps Frankfurter. Mm -hmm. Nuremberg, the Nuremberg trials, did you follow that from here in Washington? Was that a conversation? I was in the Army at that time. Right. I was in the Army for about four years, a little less. At that time, when he was in Nuremberg, I was in Berlin with General Clay. General Clay wanted to know what was going on in Nuremberg. Uh, I went down to Nuremberg, visited the justice uh, there. You have to remember the difficulty of the time. It was winter or fall, it was cold, it was wet, there wasn't adequate heat anywhere. You were chilled wherever you were. Food was inadequate and limited. I don't mean in quantity, but the kinds of stuff. Uh, for many people, uh, an occasional uh, gin or scotch uh, wasn't a necessity. Uh, it was a miserable place. And what was happening there didn't make it easier. This was a trial of some horrible people. And uh, the justice had the primary burden 
of not only bringing the issues before the world, but preserving the essential material for history, which was a vital problem and necessity of which he was deeply conscious. So that it was not an easy time for him. It was not just the work, it was the atmosphere. It was the it was like having to live in a prison with prisoners. Uh, we were all closed up there. former roommates of mine were there as a couple of them as uh, lawyers on his staff. <clears throat> Who were they? Harold Leventhal, my first uh, law partner. I have a picture of him somewhere. There he is. Oh, sure. He beca later became a judge on the Court of Appeals mm -hmm. here. and. Uh, there were others, uh, two or three of them, who had been on my staff at the Office of Price Administration, mm -hmm. so that I knew a number of people there, and all of whom were working for the Justice, who had a, and the one thing that was characteristic of them all is the high regard they had for him and his commitment, his effort an accomplishment, so that uh, this was a man that was viewed closely over a long period of time by friends. I thought that I knew him then. Mm -hmm. While at Nuremberg, how long were you at Nuremberg? Oh, I used to go up there every uh, week, fly down from uh, Berlin to Nuremberg on a Thursday and come back on a Sunday. And who would you meet while you were there? Or just were you an observer? I certainly met with, uh, from time to time, with the justice, but uh, not too much because he was busy. Uh, but I did meet with some of his assistants, including some of the people whom I knew, so that I got a fairly good picture for Clay of what was going on. Did you get a sense that Clay was in turn reporting to uh, President Truman? Was that part of his role? I had no idea. Yeah. I remember There were great differences within this country about what should happen to Germany, uh, whether it should be Morgenthau took the view that a lot of its, or most of, many of its factories should be taken away, it should be de-industrialized. Others took the view, which I shared, that it would be a catastrophe to deindustrialize the largest co uh, country in Europe, located in the central of Europe, in terms of what it would do to the continent. And so, uh, I remember Clay giving me a copy of Morgenthau's book that Morgenthau had sent to Clay, uh, outlining what he thought should be done. But that was not the policy of the government. Right. The government simply wanted to restore the capacity of uh, Germany to be a stable, central government within the con continent for its own, for the sake of its own people as well as the sake of Europe. Uh, 
and the rest of the world. So that uh, he he gave me the the book that Morgenthau had sent him. I later gave it away to someone else. So your paths would have crossed Tom Dodds over at. I beg your pardon. Your paths would have crossed Thomas Dodds over at Nuremberg. No. No. No, I uh, didn't see him then. I knew his father later when I came back to Washington. I see. When he was a senator in the Senate. But I never never ran into him. As a person, I knew he was there. Right. But I didn't know him. What was the impression back in the United States about the trial at that time? Was there interest in what was going on, or was the fact that it was after the opening statements and the original start of the trial, people lost interest? Not a bit. Yeah. Uh, I can't speak for people, but I can talk of commitments to the press. The media picked it up, dealt with it, reported regularly. Mm -hmm. It was a matter of keen interest. And so I think n nobody was astonished by what happened and a great many people were following piece by piece, as they should have, what was going on sure. there. That was an important event, and uh, the justice played a central role in what, one of the, possibly the most important single event of the, of the 20th century. After the war, did you come back? Did you stay in Berlin uh, during uh, the occupation for a period of time, or did you? Yes, uh, I got to Berlin on July fourth, nineteen forty-five. Uh, I flew up with Clay. It was a Berlin was an unbelievable wreck. We lived in a part of the city which hadn't much been injured, but uh, the impact of the war was not, not something that anyone ever forgets. Right. Uh, the human wreckage, the physical wreckage, what happens to people and to animals. The wild dogs and the wild cats, uh, as well as the wild people. Uh, this is not something that, uh, it, that once you see it, it's seared in your mind in a way in which it's never forgotten. Sure. And so, uh, but these are things you want to forget. Uh, you don't want to think about them. Mm -hmm. You don't try to recall them unless there's a, an objective. But uh, I stayed there through all of 45 and through and beyond uh, with Clay in that uh, I dealt with worked on the negotiation of the level of industry within Germany. What was to be the level of industry? How much steel they could produce? How much this or that? Uh, and we were always the ones who <laughs> were pushing for the most, the Russians for the least, the French for a little bit <laughs> more and the British closer with us, but still uh, the United States were, was always pushing for something more and concerned about how do you reconstruct the Europe, all of Europe, mm -hmm. even at that time, so that uh, the policies that later were adopted were not new. They were simply reinforced. Did you stay during the? Were you there during the airlift? Uh, no. I 
was by that time a pro after by the end of forty six I was a practicing lawyer. I had gone into the army at the, in the fall of forty two and came out in the summer of forty six. In the last part of uh, our work in Berlin, I was what was called civilianized. By that I mean given uh, a status as a private individual equivalent to a high office on the from the other military. So uh, I was given the status of general or colonel or whatever. Uh, and that was at the toward the end. Right. You come back to G Washington D.C. Tell me a little bit about your career here in Washington. Well, after the war, I reunion with the family and so on. I didn't know. I had nothing. By that I mean, I had not been practicing or doing anything as a lawyer really in the last previous four years. And before that I had been in government. At the end, as general counsel of something called the Office of Price Administration, OPA had price control, rationing, economic matters. Mm -hmm. I'd always been interested in economic matters. And uh, what does one do? I went to New York for interviews with law firms, New York, Chicago, Denver, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Seattle. Mm -hmm. I visited all of those. I hadn't spent anything of the compensation I had gotten during the uh, war. It wasn't necessary. And uh, simply used everything I had to look for a job. I came back to, I really would have chosen San Francisco. What I saw there, I liked it. So, but I didn't think I could make a go of it there. And uh, was walking in a kind of a desolate way along uh, right in front of the Mayflower Hotel here in front of and then just in the next block. And I saw a man who managed a building, smoking outside the building. So I stopped to say hello to him. I had known him. And we talked a little bit. He said, what are you doing? I said, nothing. Trying to decide what to do. He said, why don't you take some space up here? So, there were five offices on the second floor of the Elizabeth Arden building, <laughs> and uh, ninety-five dollars a month. So I just took it. I was depressed and thought, "Well, I'll just open up a side, an office," but I didn't have any. records. I had no papers. I had no mailing list. I had no what? I had no addresses. Mm -hmm. didn't know where people were. But you start out. So I took the offices, bought a copy of the U.S. Code, got a dictionary, and sent out cards in those days the only thing you could say on the card was your name, you're opening an office, and this is the address. 
You couldn't describe anything in background where it wasn't done. And so I just opened an office in, and uh, for two months I did nothing. I had nothing. So I wrote two law review articles on the Price Control Act of 19, whatever it was, Forty-two, and uh, then some. I had a letter in from a company that had gotten, had been litigating with the government about OPA, having had a problem with OPA, wanted help representation. Whoever was there knew that I had been general counsel of it, so they were looking for somebody who knew something about the the price control act. Well, that started it. Okay. Within a six months, I had several cases, and was beginning to earn a living. And that was the beginning. It was a good beginning because uh, I dealt with something I knew and there were a lot of cases left over from during the war because OPA was eliminated shortly after the war and the cases sent over to the Justice Department mm -hmm. and uh, the Justice Department would like to get rid of them, obviously, and so it was relatively easy to settle with them and that's what I did. And that was the beginning. I was having lunch across the street one day at a restaurant when uh, Leventhal walked in in uniform. He saw me. I hadn't seen him for the last four or five years. We had lived together. He sat down, had lunch. And I asked him what he was doing. He had also been, in the, not in the Navy, but the people who took care of the safety of the boats on the coast. And uh, he asked me, I asked him what he was doing. He said, nothing. So uh, I said, let's do it together. <laughs> and so uh, he came in with me as the first law partner. <clears throat> it was a happy relationship. He's a f absolutely first-rate lawyer. Mm -hmm. Had been a law clerk for one of the justices on the Supreme Court, for two of them, I think. And then um, practiced in government at the SD's office. And so, <clears throat> after that, we, grew, we had an arrangement between us that we would never grow to more than Ten lawyers, and for twenty years, we kept that. And then he went on the court, mm -hmm. and the court of appeals, and someone else came, and we decided to let it grow, and we did. I want to talk to you. I want, you do you need a break or anything? No. What's no, your no. time wait? Because I want to talk a little bit about your days with Hubert Humphrey and that whole process here. So I don't want to impinge on your time, but if you want to... <coughs> well... I want to change my tape, too, because I've run out of tape. You, this has been terrific! Well... Just terrific. It's These are memories that are pretty well engraved. You stayed active in politics when you came back, didn't you? Well, as a consequence of <clears throat> in a, an early meeting with Hubert Humphrey, I followed, uh, a, I became interested in political activity, mm -hmm. and, which would often take the case of writing memos or speeches or something of that sort. 
but uh, I did relatively little except one time with Hubert Humphrey. I thought Hubert was an extraordinarily able man. I wanted very much to see him in the presidency. I thought that he would have made a great president for the country. Uh, and when he was running against this is senior moment. It was then Nixon, of course, in 1960. No. no? Uh, earlier, Kennedy. Kennedy, right? Oh, when he was running 60. against Kennedy in 1960. Uh, I come from West Virginia, and uh, West Virginia was one of the states that had normally been. a democratic state, and in addition, I thought it would be against the whole character and mood of this state to go for Kennedy as against uh, Humphrey. He was much more like West Virginia than uh, Kennedy, and an in, in easier person uh, to be with the folks. So I had the job of going from every one of the, going to every one of the 60 counties in West Virginia to help get support for Humphrey. But uh, Joe Kennedy, Sr., and Jack Kennedy, and Bobby were all over the state with a lot of money. And uh, the state went against Humphrey. I was shocked. And so were many others who were familiar with it political situation there. But that's the way it was. Humphrey was an able man. He was vice president, of course, with uh, Johnson. I remember him at the Atlantic City uh, convention uh, when he was became vice president with Johnson but as a candidate. So uh, I knew him well. Did you recommend at the time he was going to be nominated as presidential candidate for him to resign as vice president at that time? Was that a, a, a strategic thought? Not to me, yeah. in the sense that it would have represented a break with Johnson. That is, I have resigned because I have to take a view that Johnson was wrong on this or that. Uh, I remember they convention very well I was there. I think though know, it's too distant from our subject uh, for me to go through it, no. Right. I prefer not to. Sure. It was a um, difficult period. Right. Uh, I was working with Johnson and uh, talked with him from Chicago in the presence of all the others. Right. And 
it was not something that I think will illuminate history yep. and pains me. Yeah. Were you the, did you get involved in the, as a campaign manager of Humphrey for during the campaign itself? Were you at that level? No, I was working as a personal assistant to him. Yeah. After my talk with him, with the chairman of the platform committee, and uh, I went up to see him in the when the, the Johnson at that time indicated that he wouldn't budge on his views as to what should be done. Which all of us thought he should. Right. Uh, I went to see him. He was at the in, a, in some rooms at the top of the hotel. I'll never forget the day. Uh, lying down on the bed, his bed, and I came in to report on the conversation with Johnson and all the other people who have been part of that conversation. Sure. And uh, I remember his reaction. What more can we do? Mm -hmm. This is it. And that was that. And uh, he had to take it. No. Did your paths, when you were general counsel for the Office of Price Administration, did your paths cross with Nixon's? Did what? Did your paths cross with Richard Nixon? Was he a, was he a young attorney in the? Oh yes. Uh, when I first became general counsel and began to recognize the scope of what we had. had to control prices in the country and to stable, help to stabilize wages and to prevent interest rates from moving more than they should. It, one had a feeling of enormity. This is big. You're going to need more people. You have to have compliance. And the willingness on the part of the country a recognition on the part of the country that is important. And so I started to recruit people. Several see law schools at the time were closed sure. because the men, young men were going off to the war. So I recruited a number of the professors who were on my staff from the Harvard Law School or others around the country. A lot of people were going into the army and so, or the military, and elsewhere in the government. It was very hard to recruit. One of my professors from Harvard was teaching at Duke. I picked up the phone, called them, and said, I need help to get good people for the staff right. He gave me the names of several people. I got them one by one over the phone and had them come in. And one of them, was a fellow named Nixon on the West Coast. And I called, and ultimately, I won't go through it, uh, hired him and put him into, I think it was rationing. Mm -hmm. Did a good job, and, but he stayed about a year and then went into the military. That was happening all over the place. Sure. And uh, 
So it was Richard Nixon, and that was his first job in Washington. Uh, I have no stories particularly about his work. He worked directly for a man named Tom Harris, <coughs> from whom I had reports about him. <coughs> Hello? I think so, absolutely. So Richard Nixon, ironically, your paths crossed in 1942 and yes, 1968. But, uh, <laughs> he was Richard Nixon, a student, yeah. and not at the time. I only saw him once when he was president. Uh, I had a call to come in, and it was about the time that we went off the gold standard and technical. It was nice, but uh, other people had uh, different relationships with them than I did. Sure. I see you have a picture here inscribed to you from Louis Brandeis. Who? Brandeis. Louis Brandeis. Yeah. I, when we first came to Washington, when I came first, came to Washington. Ben was very close to Brandeis, Ben Cohen. And Brandeis used to have teas on the Tuesdays when the court was not in session. And so Ben once took me to one of the teas, and I came to know the, the justice and see a lot of them mm -hmm. uh, on the, the teas. With Paul Freund, I had uh, uh, dinner with him and with Mrs. Brandeis one night. And uh, I also knew some of his law clerks very well. So that I had a feeling that I knew him reasonably well. What kind of guy was he? Serious. Mm -hmm not flippant. Uh, I saw no evidence of a sense of humor particularly, but uh, conversational, easy to talk with, uh, serious-minded. He was one of the judges who was affected by things that were not legal particularly. He was interested in facts. Uh, if it was a, a company was getting very big, what were the consequences? Uh, what actually were the consequences? Not what you think happened. What did happen on the ground? Uh, he was serious to the point that he really wanted to know not the formulae, but the result. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just revered him. He was what a Supreme Court justice should be. Uh, he's one of the few that have not been marked by their service on the court. He left behind great opinions, and he uh, was a man who committed himself to the court. Mm -hmm. When he went on the court, it was his total life. But uh, he had other interests and other concerns as a citizen, but his court responsibilities were primary. He was there during the Roosevelt's administration attempt to increase the court, the court packing time period in 1937. What was your thoughts about that? You were sort of in the, I don't say in the decision making, but you're in the mix there's, there. There's a lot of talk about this, and I'm sure that more than one person is working on a book. 
uh, a man named Warner Gardner has written a piece in the Harvard Law Review. Mm -hmm. about the so-called court packing plan and its origins. Mm -hmm. uh, that comes as close to the truth as I know. Right. Uh, on the Sunday after it came out, I had breakfast at a classmate's home where Ben and Tom were having breakfast too, with the, just the four of us. And I kept pushing whether Ben and Tom knew of it beforehand, or whether Frankfurter knew about it beforehand. They thought, one, they said at the time, one, we did, we did not know those two. And they have a sense regarding Frankfurter, whether he might have known? That's, uh, and they were this is what I was stumbling about. They thought that Frankfurter had no clue. Warner Gardner thinks that they had knowledge when Warner wrote. He died a year or so ago. He thought that they knew about it. My own view is that they did not know about it. They would have had no reason to mystify Joe or myself, Joe Rao or myself about the matter. Uh, it was originated according to, originated by Cummings, who was the Attorney General, mm -hmm. and his staff. Yeah. And that's how, and sold to the President, that was that. They didn't like it. And no one who respected the court wanted that to happen. Did a Lewis Brand? What? I've got. It's getting close now. I know. This has been just terrific. I can't thank you enough for your time.